first to introduce to you members of the platform party in addition to our speaker. First, I would like to have you greet uh, on your left, Mr. Edward Seaton, who is the Land Landon Patron Chairperson. Edward. <laughs> Dr. Bill Richter, who is chairman of the series, and I would like to give, uh, have you give him special thanks and credit because Bill is scheduled for a sabbatical this next year, and thank him for the tremendous job he has done as chairman of the Land and Lecture Series. Bill Richter. <laughs> On your right, uh, Dr. Richard Gallagher, professor of electrical engineering and faculty senate president, Dr. Gallagher. And yet relatively new, our student body president, Mr. Ken Hines. Ken? And we have a special guest with us in the audience that I would like to have you greet, Governor John Carlin. Governor Carlin. Today we are pleased to have with us Tom Bradley, mayor of the city of Los Angeles. Mayor Bradley attended the University of California at Los Angeles and joined the Los Angeles Police Department in 1940, rising to the rank of lieutenant. He and his family had come to Los Angeles from South Central Texas in the 1930s. While serving in the police department, Tom Bradley earned a law degree at Southwestern University in Los Angeles. Upon completion of his degree, he left the Los Angeles Police Department, went into private law practice, and in 1961 launched his successful political career with election to the City Council. And it was during his service on the City Council of Los Angeles that my wife and I had the privilege of meeting Tom Bradley and spending a bit more than a week with him in, in, East, in West Germany on the 20th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. And upon my return to Kansas State in 75 and becoming acquainted with the Land and Lecture Series, determined that he was one that I wanted to bring to this platform. Tom Bradley's expertise in urban affairs brought him national attention. And in 1974, he was elected president of the National League of Cities. Tom Bradley was elected mayor of Los Angeles in 1973 and re-elected with large margins in 1977 and 1981. With his leadership, Los Angeles has forged a strong partnership among business, labor, and government, resulting in redevelopment and new construction throughout the city. More than 200,000 new jobs have been created in the Los Angeles area, and he has worked to maintain the kind of healthy economic climate which attracts new business to the city from all over the world. Mayor Bradley, le Bradley led the effort in 1977 and 1978 to bring the 1984 Summer Olympic Games to Los Angeles. With strong commitment to the diverse populations within his community and attention to continuing communication between the citizens and the city government, Mayor Tom Bradley, Bradley has led this nation's second largest city. It is my pleasure to present to you today the Mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Tom Bradley. Tom. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction to the distinguished platform guests, to Governor Carlin. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share a few minutes with you this morning. I want to uh, alert you very early. Uh, I'm going to be fairly brief in my opening remarks in order to give you a chance to ask questions. I think in that way, uh, uh, our interests will better coincide, and I can cover the items that are of interest to you rather than to me. Some asked me when I told them I was coming to Kansas State University, Kansas, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I assume that the reason they asked that question is that very few make the connection between the the heartland of this nation, Kansas, its great agricultural uh, reputation, 
and the state of California. And I have to remind them that California's number one industry is agriculture. Most think of our uh, high technology industries, the aerospace, the movie industry, uh, the electronics industry, the many industries that uh, make up our great state, and they somehow fail to make a connection between ha what happens in our cities and what happens on the farms, both of California and the rest of this nation. Just as you provide much of the food for not only this nation, but for other parts of the world, California has done a remarkable job in that fashion. And one of my main concerns is that somehow our children in particular, as well as the housewives who go to the supermarket to do their shopping, don't make that connection. They somehow think that that uh, material shows up automatically on those shelves and on the counters there at the supermarket. And they fail to understand uh, what a tremendous linkage there is between the urban centers of this nation and the farmlands which produce the products that uh, help us to maintain our stability. Recently, I've launched a program in our city working with the California Farm Bureau Federation and with the California Women in Agriculture to help better inform the people of our community. Uh, just last week, I had one such example of that uh, educational effort. Uh, we brought from uh, some of the surrounding communities, uh, some members of the 4-H club, some uh, farmers with uh, some of their animals, brought them to one of the inner city schools where the youngsters bug-eyed as they watched these animals. Uh, you should have seen the looks on their faces as they uh, petted the lambs and the goats, the little ones in particular. And what a thrill it was for them to not only see a cow, but to milk one. Well, you can imagine uh, what a difference that's going to make in, one, in their understanding and their comprehension of how we are one people tied together in so many ways. But that's the quality of, of that kind of an effort. And I've been very pleased that we've been able to make a beginning in that kind of information process. So there is that connection between Tom Bradley, Los Angeles, California, and Kansas State University. The other connection, and I suppose this is more persuasive, the one reason why I'm really here. Uh, Dr. Ocker referred to our having met in 1967 in Germany, and we've remained friends since that time. Over the years, uh, he has asked he has invited, he has pleaded, he has implored, he has demanded <laughs> that I come here and uh, visit with him and his wife Shirley and also to speak to you. I must tell you, your president is very persistent. <laughs> and he finally got his way and here I am. I'm greatly honored to be considered uh, one of the speakers at the Landon Lecture Series. Governor Landon was, uh, I suppose, one of the most admired and respected men in the whole field of American politics. And it is a great honor uh, to have been requested and then to receive the great privilege of being a part of this lecture series. I hope that it will not come as a disappointment to you, but I have not uh, laid out any well-prepared statement or speech. You will not get any profound message. I hope that I will be able to give you something uh, that will be a practical example that can be of use to many young people in particular. You know, as I look about this country and I, I hear the expression of despair from so many, when I hear from young people in particular, well, 
you know, nothing's going to happen based upon my participation in politics. Not much has changed in this country. We're not making much progress. Generally, they're looking at history in the context of the past year. We, of course, know that you've got to measure history over a longer period of time. And so it is my hope that today I can, in some way, by some personal examples, give some impression of how I think one person can make a difference and how the efforts of that one person multiplied millionfold over can make a difference not only in our society but in humankind. I believe that each of us has an obligation to leave our society a far wiser, far richer, far better society than we found it. If each of us can just fulfill half of that obligation through our own commitment, then I think the future is going to be bright. Now, if the task of changing society, of making improvements, of achieving progress for ourselves as well as for our country, I believe that there is a way to, to look at the obstacles that you are confronted with in life. And if you believe that it is possible, if you are determined enough, I think that you can make a change. I think that you can overcome those obstacles. And I believe that in the end, your impossible dreams can come true. I have sort of selected the impossible dream as my favorite song uh, because my whole life has been a living out of what one might say has been the impossible dream. Let me start with, with my birthplace, Calvert, Texas, a little town in Texas where my family uh, worked as sharecroppers with little hope for the future for themselves or their children. At the end of the month, you owed more than you had made during that past month. And they determined that if life was to be any better for them or their children, they had to leave Texas. And so we started our trek to the west. California was a land of golden opportunity. It was a land of promise and hope. And so that was where we headed. By the time we got here, I must, or there, I must tell you, uh, the experience through which we went in my early childhood, I went there at the age seven. Uh, there wasn't much in the way of any hope. Things were tough, especially for those who were poor, economically depressed, or of a minority extraction. Little in the way of symbols of, of success to which a black youngster could point and say, well, that person made it, so can I. And so it did take a great deal of faith and confidence, a belief in oneself to permit me to go out each and every day to face the world and, and to have any sense of confidence that uh, things were going to change. One of the things that my family, my mother and father, drilled into me, and I'm ever grateful to them for it, since they had no formal education, fifth grade having been the highest achievement for either one of them, they recognized the importance of education, its value, its ability to serve as a tool, a key to opening up the doors of opportunity. So they kept drilling into my head the fact that I must go to college, I must get a good education. And will you believe me, in those days, the height of the Depression, there was hardly any idea how I might somehow get into college to say nothing of having that college education do very much for me in the way of producing a life of success or happiness. But I believed what they said. I studied everything I could get my hands on. And by the time I reached junior high school, in preparing my program uh, for the balance of the uh, junior high school career, 
I had to make a determination as to whether it was going to be an academic course or a commercial course or uh, whatever. And when I indicated that I wanted an academic course, my counselor said, I don't know why you're doing this, you're wasting your time. Uh, black youngsters at that time were lucky if they got out of high school. It was a waste in that person's judgment to take an academic course preparing me for college when there was so little chance I would get there. But I was a stubborn one. I said, I won't believe, I won't listen to, I'm not going to follow that kind of advice. Took the academic course. Uh, at that time, I was a newspaper delivery boy. By the time I got to high school, I determined that uh, I was not going to be able to continue that job if I were going to find the means to go to college because I was a pretty good athlete. And I wanted to go out for high school athletics hoping that someday that might be my entry into college. My mother willingly accepted that decision, though she had never seen a football or football game or a track meet in her life. But what uh, impressed her was that if her son wanted it, that's what she wanted. And she took on an extra job just to make it possible for me to give up mine and to follow a career in athletics. And as a consequence of that experience, having been uh, uh, the top uh, track man, quarter miler, I did a few other things as well, but having been uh, the foremost quarter miler in, in the city, and having been selected as an all-city football player, uh, the future as far as getting into college was pretty well assured. And I was recruited and went to UCLA. And a whole new world opened up for me. I had been to a high school that uh, had a campus of about 1,500 students, only 100 of them black. Uh, there were the usual kinds of uh, expressions of discrimination, uh, the inability to get into service clubs, being uh, restricted to uh, one particular uh, service group, there, there were such expressions of discouragement all around me that one sometimes wondered, well, how do you overcome that? Uh, but it was determination that did it. And uh, as a result of that experience, I really got my first entry into politics. I ran for uh, the office of uh, uh, president of our, our boys league at that school, something that was unheard of for a black or any other minority. Just as they told me then, you can't do it, you can't make it, it isn't possible. I refuse to believe them. I guess I've lived that way all of my life. People telling me what I couldn't do, and I being determined that I was gonna show them I could. Yes, I can, and I did. But it was that experience that led uh, to UCLA, which as I indicated to you, did open up a whole new life for me, uh, new friends, new opportunities, new exposures to the environment in which I went to school and then began to live. That uh, is something that I shall ever be grateful for because I think that uh, had I not done so, my pattern, my life would have followed that of many of my other uh, schoolmates who later became the misfits in society because they gave up hope. Many of them wound up in the jails and prisons of our city and our state. Most of them failed to achieve much in the way of satisfaction or happiness in life. But my spirit of determination carried me through those difficult periods of my early career. I suppose that one might say, well, how do you gain that sense of confidence that you can do something that people say you can't. One of the ways in which I have always been able to do it is to look at a particular experience. I can remember sitting in classroom and, and uh, with my eyes wide, uh, looking at those teachers with awe. And it wasn't until I began to work very hard, study very hard, and get a pretty good knowledge of my own that I realized those teachers aren't that superior, they aren't that much better than I. 
They don't know in some cases as much as I. And I think that was the beginning. So as I went through life, at each step, I began to look at those around me and say, you know, if that person could do it, you know, he or she is not that great. I think I can as well. And that was true whether it was in school or whether it was uh, in law school. I remember how tough it was going, working an eight-hour day job and then going to night law school. And as uh, the semester would roll on, you'd wonder, how can I make it through this entire course? And then how can I pass the bar and become a lawyer? And then I'd look around me and I'd see lawyers who were practicing. Now, it's not to say that uh, some of them weren't great. <laughs> <laughs> I realized how ordinary these people were. <laughs> and I said, you know, if, 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 you mean he made it? <laughs> if he can make it, so can I. And that was another one of these uh, things that, that uh, I experienced and helped me make it through law school and then through the bar. I remember watching members of our city council. Now, if you ever want disillusionment, get close to some who served in those capacities, and that's what I did. And I said, you know, I think I could do that job as well or better than, and I can name half a dozen of them easily, and if I looked carefully, I could probably include all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ran at a district which uh, was about one-third black, did what they said could not be done, and won against an incumbent by a two to one margin. I served there for six years and I began looking around, what's next? And I said, uh, you know, all of these jobs are gonna be tough, whether it's running for the Board of Supervisors or the State Legislature or the Congress. If I'm gonna risk my time and effort and those folks' money, I might as well go after the top job. So I declared for mayor and ran. Uh, but it was a result of looking at the incumbent and realizing uh, that here was another ordinary human being and that uh, if he could do it, however well or poorly he was doing it, I could as well. And so I, I made that uh, step. I must tell you when uh, 1982, I decided to run for governor of California. There were those who said, no, it can't be done. You know, don't waste your time and our money. Uh, they were suggesting that uh, the attitude, the racial attitude in the state of Cali California was such that uh, black couldn't possibly be elected governor. Well, I looked at some of the governors who'd served, and once again I said, I don't know. And I guess I wasn't too far wrong because out of eight million votes that were cast in 1982, uh, I lost by only about 90,000 votes. Closest election in the history of the state of California. And I'll tell you in a moment some of the reasons why I think that, uh, that result did occur. You know, I went to the White House and I looked around, I was impressed. <laughs> My friends, if you can believe it, if you can conceive it, you can do it. And that's the way I've looked at life, and that's one of the things I would hope I can get across to this audience today. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. Make up your own mind, believe in yourself. Believe in what may be considered the impossible. And if you have the spirit, the determination, the will, and a willingness to sacrifice for what you want. You can do it. I remember the 1969 campaign, one of the, the most racial campaigns ever in the history of California. I had won the primary with 42% of the vote, and my uh, opponent, the incumbent mayor, received 26%. It looked as though it was going to be easy from that point on. 
And I did lead in the polls right up until about the last uh, two weeks of the election campaign. But in the course of that campaign, some of the most vicious racial uh, statements ever conceived were thrown at me and the people of that city. And finally, in the closing weeks, people just buckled under it. It was too much. And they did become fearful that all of the police department would quit, that the black militants would take over City Hall, the, even the most outrageous statements that one can imagine. But they did have an impact. And the lead, which I had enjoyed up to that moment, finally began to deteriorate. And, and I lost that election by a slim margin. But I determined the night of that election that never again would that happen to me. And uh, so the following morning, I was up and out campaigning. I went to every neighborhood, every section of that city. I wanted people to know me for who I was, what I was, what I stood for, not to listen to some uh, campaign rhetoric that was not based upon fact and then uh, be guided by that. I wanted them to make their judgment on Tom Bradley, the man. What I stood for, the content of my character rather than the color of my skin. And after four years of that kind of campaigning, it did pay off. And there were many of my young supporters who came to me in uh, 1969 after the election was over and said, Mr. Bradley, how can you now tell us to, to work within the system? How can you tell us to believe in fairness and justice in this country after what happened to you? Well, I've never let any of these experiences embitter me or disillusion me to the point where I was not able to pick myself up and take off again. And so I had to convince them to hang in there. And I believe that the best way to do that was to demonstrate uh, by my own example that spirit of stick to -itiveness. In 1973, the same kind of rhetoric was used by the same opponent. This time it didn't work because the people had come to know me. And I won that election handily and I'm proud to say that in the two elections since then have been overwhelmingly elected and re-elected by the people of my city. From every section of the city, I now enjoy the respect and the support. Uh, we have a nonpartisan system, so political parties don't really mean anything in city elections. I am supported by Republicans and Democrats, and the business community and labor leaders, supported by the homeowner groups in every neighborhood, every region of that city. I want every district. This is what I am trying to use as an example of what can happen if you believe in yourself, if you're willing to work for what you want. Now, in the governor's race, uh, almost a parallel thing happened in some respects, not the racial campaign that uh, I experienced in, in the city election, uh, but some of the, the statements, some of the charges uh, of various kinds, not based upon fact, uh, were used in that campaign. And to have gained almost four million voters supporting me in California. You know, in Los Angeles, uh, the black population is 17%, and that was considered quite an achievement. That people were colorblind in, in their decisions to elect their mayor. And I had hoped that we could do the same thing in California. And for the most part, we accomplished that. Some who have evaluated that election uh, looked at three things as the reasons why I failed to win in the end. One of them was a gun control measure, which was on the ballot, not my proposal, but one which I supported. And that brought out a lot more people who had uh, no intentions of voting otherwise who, since they were going to vote against the, the gun control uh, legislation, decided they'd vote against the man who said he was in favor of it, and that was me. The Republican Party uh, did what I think was the most effective absentee ballot drive we had ever seen. It was quite legal, but never before had it been done. They mailed two million absentee ballots. 
and they collected all of them. They had them returned to them. Uh, they've looked at the figures, and they say that of those who went to the ballot box on Election Day, I got the majority of the votes, but my opponent got the majority of the absentee ballots. And that made a difference. Uh, there were some who said they would never vote for a black man, and they estimate that uh, about 70% of the voters had expressed a similar attitude. Uh, you can see that any one of these things alone would not have made the difference. But when you combined all three of them, they did make the difference, and tilted uh, the scales by the 90,000 votes that made the difference in the end. Now, some have asked, have you given up? Haven't you had enough? The answer is no. I have adopted the slogan of Winston Churchill that he used uh, to the British uh, colleagues during World War II. And in essence, what he said to them was, never, 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 never give in. And I have no intention of giving in. I'm not finished yet. And if young people in particular will adopt that attitude that they will never surrender, that they will never quit, Nobody can stop you. So you'll be hearing from me. I'm not ready to retire. You'll hear from me again. <laughs> now, that's enough of personal references. Uh, I do want to touch just briefly upon some things, because I think that if we look at the last 20 years in this country, we have seen tremendous progress having been made, and I'm very proud of it didn't come easily, it took a lifetime of struggle, it took the lives of many people, it took commitment on the part of, of uh, literally millions, but that commitment, that effort has made the difference. Let me cite three things. One of them is the Voting Rights Act. At the time of the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, there were about 500 blacks who held public office in this nation in the entire country. Today, there are over 5,500 who hold offices of every kind. This is a clear indication of the shift, the change in attitude that has taken place. One, the right of all people to register and vote. And secondly, the willingness of the people to look beyond color or sexual orientation or look beyond the question of economic circumstances of their, their uh, prospective leaders, and to choose them based upon their ability, what they stand for rather than where they came from, rather than the color of their skin. And I'm very proud of that development, that progress which has been made by this nation. I look at one other change that has occurred, the right to public accommodations. And uh, I've been through Kansas before. I was here in 1953. I had driven a car from Lansing, Michigan. I was on my way home. I had to stop for a convention in, in Topeka. I drove all the way from Lansing uh, to Topeka before I was able to rest my head. Couldn't get a, a motel, or motel or an inn that would accept me. I couldn't find a restaurant that would serve me. That has been changed, and for the better for this nation and all of us. I can remember in World War II when we couldn't, a black, couldn't get a job driving a bus in our city. Today, they got blacks a part of the astronaut team flying to the moon. Today, Opportunities for jobs have been opened, and the hope for additional expansion is all around you for blacks, for other minorities, for everyone in this country. That is the sense of progress. That's the progress which we have made in this country in terms of equality of opportunity. I hope that every one of you is as proud of this development, these changes, as I am. I'm not 
standing here suggesting to you that uh, it's perfect, that we've done everything that we ought to do, and that we come as far as we are going to go, because I don't believe that. But we come a long way in my lifetime. We come a long way in the last 20 years. And if we measure history based upon that period of time, then I think you get some degree of hope for the future. You can really believe that it's possible for you. And that's what I encourage young people to do as I try to serve as a role model for them. Believe in yourself. Take a look at history, not at the last year. And if you can't agree with me that we've made much progress, but more to come, uh, then I don't understand the whole sweep of history. We are a nation which has truly been transformed in the last 20 years. But we're a nation which is, in my judgment, on the verge of the ultimate breakthrough, total, unqualified, unconditional equality of opportunity for all people in this nation. And we talked about our Constitution, what it promises, what rights we ought to be able to enjoy as human beings. What an impression we make in the rest of the world based solely upon what we do to live out the hopes and dreams contained in our Constitution. These things that I've referred to already are the accumulation of individual effort. You know, there wasn't some mandate, some directive that came from on high. It happened because each individual decided for himself or herself what he or she was going to do to help change our society. And the accumulation of all of these many millions coming together creates the powerful force that has mandated, that has brought about these changes to which I have referred. Every student, every young person must believe in himself or herself, set their goals high, and believe that there are no impossible dreams for possibility thinkers. It is my hope that the life of Tom Bradley and I just happen to use that one because I know it a little bit better than the rest, that that life can be a source of inspiration, of encouragement, of hope for the future, for each of you and for this nation. Thank you very much. This lecture series is on public issues, and I don't think there's a more important public issue than that of bringing out the latent leadership that exists in our society, especially in the young people. Mayor Bradley has consented to, ask, to answer questions. There is a microphone to your left and one to your right, and uh, he'll handle his own questions directly, and we invite, uh, we invite questions from the audience. Uh, yes, Mayor Bradley. You'll have to excuse me if my question seems slightly candid, but it's of something that's of great concern to me, and that's um, given President Reagan's somewhat deplorable record in the area of civil rights and the fact that during his term he has sought consistently to reverse regulatory trends in the area of civil rights that have existed for more than two decades, I would like to know what do you see as the future of such programs as affirmative action, quotas, busing, the Supreme Court, under a second term of unaccountability of President Reagan. You, you've uh, asked quite a mouthful. 
and I'm not going to try to answer you in, in every detail. I am concerned that many of the strides which have been made uh, have, in some cases, been under attack. Some effort has been made to turn the clock back, to erode this progress, and whether it is the makeup of the United States Civil Rights Commission or the actions taken by the administration with regard to a number of other achievements. Uh, I think that this is just another challenge that uh, we as a people uh, must confront. And I think that it is uh, evident that uh, many of these efforts have been thwarted, either by the Congress or the courts. Uh, so the fact that the president, uh, whether in good faith or uh, for whatever motives, has done or attempted these things, I think that uh, you have been able to see that most of them have, in fact, been denied. He has not succeeded in many of these efforts. But I think it is a clear indication to us that the battle is not won, it's not over, and we must continue to fight, one, to gain, secondly, to preserve the basic and fundamental rights to which we are entitled. Uh, I'm not I'm going to try to make this into a, a, a partisan <laughs> platform. Uh, but I know that you've heard at least one candidate, perhaps uh, two, perhaps three, make statements in this regard, the things that uh, they propose to do if elected president. And I think, one, that uh, whatever the outcome of that election, so long as these issues are articulated and are foremost in the minds of the American public in the course of this year of political debate, it is going to have a dampening effect upon the efforts of anybody to change, to turn back the clock on these kinds of issues. And if one of these other candidates is successful, uh, it, I think, will have a dramatic effect uh, in, in the kind of statements and actions being taken at the top level of government. Our large cities and indeed Los Angeles is air quality and quantities of drinking water. I was wondering what steps you were taking in Los Angeles to ensure good air quality while fostering economic development and what you were doing to ensure uh, future water supplies for your city. Los Angeles, as you well know, is one of the cities in the nation which is uh, uh, highest in population but also highest in, in the level of air pollution first fact we're proud of, the second we're not proud of. Uh, there are two basic reasons. One uh, it comes from the industrial sources of, of air pollution. And I must say, I think we've done a pretty good job of dealing with that issue through regulations, through enforcement, uh, through the uh, countermeasures that have been taken on the industrial and commercial sources of air pollution. Uh, we are attempting others through uh, the strategies of, of uh, carpooling, of location of basic and major industry, uh, so as to minimize uh, the impact of air pollution. And so in that field, I think we've, we've pretty well uh, done uh, most of the things that I think any responsible community can do. And uh, with regard to the automobile, which is now the major almost a uh, single source of air pollution uh, that uh, we have not completely overcome. Uh, we have not achieved much in the way of, of uh, success. And it's going to take some of the engineers, perhaps some coming out of this institution, uh, who hopefully will one day find a solution to the air pollution poured out by the automobile. We're going to have to continue to work on every element of the air pollution problem it is already pretty clear that it is destroying uh, both the forests of this nation, uh, polluting the rivers and streams and lakes of uh, many parts of the country. It is life-threatening. It is uh, harmful to the health of the people. Uh, and it is something we simply must come to grips with. I served on the National Air Quality uh, Panel uh, that studied the matter for two years, what we could do in changing the, the 
Clean Air Act, how we can make it more responsible and more effective. And we made a number of recommendations. I'm going to tell you, not many of them have yet been adopted, but we haven't given up. In the field of uh, water, clean water, I think the danger has just been fully understood by many people, both in government and uh, in the lay community. And a lot of steps have been taken to deal with it. It's going to be a very expensive process, uh, but steps have already been taken by the Environmental Protection Agency and, and others that I think is going to lead to cleaner water in this country. But each of us has a responsibility because, you know, that water doesn't become polluted uh, by something that falls out of the sky. It's primarily what falls out of our hands in our shops and in our stores and in our industries. And we are going to have to be more responsible in how we care for uh, the precious and uh, uh, finite source of water in this nation. Uh, and both these scores, I think progress has been made. Not enough yet, but we're on our way. Question over here. Good morning, Mayor Bradley. Good morning. Um, urban school systems are increasingly enrolling and servicing great numbers of minority clients. I'm concerned that decision-making personnel across the country does not reflect representation of the clientele. By decision-making personnel, now I'm referring to um, high-level administrative staffs at local school systems, boards of regions, state and local boards of education, et cetera. Many qualified educators instruct at the college level because they are not being placed in decision-making roles for which they've trained in public schools. Do you have um, suggestions for calling attention to this situation and a commitment to changing the current status? And what I'd like for you to state for me are specific objectives that you might use to achieve this goal. One, I think that uh, the alarming rate of dropouts, the failures in our schools, especially among minority youngsters, is one of the most threatening things in our society. It simply must be dealt with. Uh, I think that, that there are a number of things that need to be done. One, there needs to be a reform in education. We are, over the years, uh, seeing a, a, a deterioration uh, because we find youngsters paying more attention to television than they do to their books, having less homework than some of us in the older generation uh, took for granted. Shorter hours, uh, fewer days in the school year. Uh, these are all things that must be changed. In some states, this has been recognized and some modest efforts have already begun in that regard. I think this is important. There must be uh, greater financial support for education. Uh, I'm sorry to say California has slipped uh, probably as bad, if not worse, than most states in the nation and has been one of the, that has been one of the critical issues in the last two or three years. We are going to have to make a financial commitment. We who no longer have children in school must understand the importance of an additional sacrifice, whether it's additional taxes that we have to bear or the additional burden, which it becomes ours to share, that the whole future of this nation, all of us, is dependent upon the leadership in the nation based upon our success in teaching our young people in school. And we can't wait until they get to high school to make that change. By then, it's too late. It must begin in our elementary schools. It must begin in pre uh, preschool uh, training. I have proposed that we try a couple of, of uh, innovative uh, ideas uh, which will keep young people in uh, a controlled atmosphere for a longer period of time than they are, not just the classroom hours, but it is what happens when they get out of class and they go home, either to no direction, no supervision, no motivation, or uh, worse, uh, where, <laughs> where the only control they have is on uh, the streets of their, their neighborhoods. And I think that if we're not going to be able to quickly enough stimulate that parent understanding, motivation, 
then we ought to have some mechanism in our school system uh, that will provide uh, some additional uh, formalized structures for controlling the environment even after their formal classroom days are over. Uh, we've seen this happen in some countries around the world uh, where almost uh, surrogate uh, uh, parental guidance is provided. We see it in some preschool settings. But I think that some system of that kind could work. I'd like to see it tried on an experimental basis uh, so that we can determine whether or not it is going to be successful. Uh, let me cite one example. In Israel, they have what they call a kibbutz. Uh, in, in these settings, a controlled environment, not with the parents, but with others who are in charge of these youngsters on a, a full day basis, and you can see the dramatic results that come from that. Uh, these are just some things that need to be done. I think that uh, getting parents into the classroom uh, can be one of the effective ways of helping in, in this area of, of uh, greater attention, uh, more discipline, and better learning. Uh, parents, uh, in far too many cases, uh, don't know what happens until they see the report card, even if they, at that time, see and sign those cards. We have seen a dramatic difference between uh, schools where the administration is sensitive, is caring, is concerned, is disciplined enough that they demand the best of those students, and they motivate uh, the teachers. I can see the dramatic difference between schools that are six or 12 blocks apart. It's like the difference between night and day. And I think that uh, we need to develop uh, better, stronger administrators in order that they influence those teachers. We need to get some system where the parents can come into those classrooms, even if they do nothing more than sit there. You have no idea of the influence that a parent sitting in a classroom or on the playground will have on youngsters who know that Mrs. Jones from down the street from where I live is standing there on the school ground or sitting in the classroom. Some of that acting out, some of the hostility that you now see, I think would disappear. Uh, these are only some of the ideas, but much more is going to have to be done uh, to correct the situation to which you just uh, referred. Five new pie, Brother Bradley. Yes, sir. You spoke of the strides that you made in the state of California with reference to the political arena and how the majority of society had come across to support you in your various campaign endeavors. My concern is with the current presidential election, I'd like to know your comment on why is it that the person running for president who happens to be black is being painted as a black candidate only rather than a, pre a candidate who's capable of leading this pluralistic society of ours. Uh, when you say painted, I presume you're talking about press references to him. I'm talking about the press references, uh, seemingly in the fact that he is only a presidential candidate for blacks and not for a majority society as well. I think in part the reference comes because that's where he's getting the bulk of his support. He has talked about a rainbow coalition and diversity of, of the support uh, that actually has not developed uh, to the extent that he had hoped. And when you look at the voting patterns, you'll find that, that the bulk of his support is coming from the black communities wherever uh, the results are coming in. Uh, the fact that the press overemphasizes, in my judgment, the, uh, the color of the candidate uh, is something I hope we someday can change. I can remember that in uh, the elections which I ran, whether it was for mayor or uh, for governor, uh, there was a daily, almost a constant reference to Tom Bradley, the black councilman, or Tom Bradley, the black mayor. Uh, I wish that that were not so. Uh, we have been able to document uh, this whole pattern. Whether it has an influence or not, I don't think that it ought to be done. Uh, you refer to the candidate based upon what he or she does or stands for or his program or 
what he or she is saying, not a question of what his or her color may be. Uh, I have been pleased to uh, note that following my election uh, to the office of mayor, uh, almost, uh, I would say within 30 days, there was no longer the reference to Tom Bradley, the black mayor. It was Tom Bradley, the mayor. If I did something right, it was Tom Bradley who did it right. If I did something wrong, it was Tom Bradley yeah. who did something wrong. That's the way it ought to be. And I would hope that just as the press finally came to uh, that uh, point during the course of their reporting on my activities as mayor, that ultimately they'll come to a similar conclusion uh, as they report to campaigns. That's the only way that we're going to root out uh, some of that latent racial motivation which directs and guides some people. I assalamu alaikum. Well, anyhow, this is my first time getting a chance to talk over the microphone, Mayor Bradley. But anyhow, I'm, I'm thinking about a man by the name of Imam Warahdi Muhammad. I'm quite sure that you have met him. And uh, what is your opinion of him as a leader and a teacher among the American people? I have not uh, had a sufficient opportunity to observe him, to watch him, uh, to give you that kind of assessment. Uh, we differ on some things. Uh, we uh, agree on some things. But I, I don't believe that I'm uh, prepared to give you an in-depth evaluation uh, or to make the kind of comments that you've just asked for. On. The whole uh, question of equality of opportunity, uh, the right of every person in this nation uh, to be able to develop and to achieve according to his or her potential. Uh, these are a couple of the fundamental things on which we are in complete agreement. Mayor Bradley, yes. you've been expounding on the importance of education in your life and in, in our, our whole societies. Um, I'd like to know if you harbor that same belief as I do that spending $300 billion on defense is quite an atrocity and that the true defense and real priority of our country should be linked, I mean, is linked to education and not to defense. Well, uh, as a mayor, I have seen uh, uh, the battle between domestic spending and so-called military spending, and I've seen uh, support for the cities of this nation suffer because there was, in my judgment, an overemphasis on, on some military spending. This is not to say we ought not to be strong, that we ought not to have the kind of, of uh, support for defense that uh, this nation deserves, uh, but I think that there has to be that balance, and uh, I have uh, from time to time been critical of certain kinds of expenditures that I thought did not represent the kind of balance and long-term interest of the nation. Because uh, we are strong militarily, but weak domestically and internally, uh, that uh, could be the Achilles heel for the nation. And no amount of defense, no amount of armaments could save us. Uh, so it is my hope that uh, what we've seen in the Congress, for example, when the President has asked for uh, a 13% uh, uh, real uh, uh, increase in, in expenditures for defense, the Congress has finally brought that back to what is, in my judgment, more reasonable. And this is the kind of process that goes on. Uh, so I think it's one of the great beauties of this nation that uh, there is the balance uh, because of the separate uh, jurisdiction of the Congress and the legislative branch and the executive branch and the judicial branch. Uh, I think that uh, though we may be critical of a particular thing, uh, you all, always must throw into that balance, yes, but what has actually happened and not uh, what has been proposed. And if you look at the, at the results, in the end, I think you're going to find that there has been that kind of balance where we have been able to maintain our, our uh, uh, defense strength, yet at the same time, 
uh, be able to support those social programs, domestic programs, uh, that are important uh, to the diversity that which is so much enriched the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to visit with you. You've been listening to an address by the Mayor of Los Angeles, Tom Bradley, speaking in the series of landed lectures on public issues at Kansas State University from McCain Auditorium on the Kansas State University campus. Our engineers were Del Staub and Len Parker. The program was produced by Extension Radio Television Film at Kansas State University over the K-State radio network.